people that will go out. All right, so we're going to be reading Psalm chapter 51 this morning. Psalm 51. And uh, I asked many to uh, go ahead and handle the scriptures for me, but I did want to point out that in my particular Bible app, it actually has a little bit of a description. And so this is the description. I'm just going to go ahead and read to you what my description says. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. When Nathan the prophet came unto him after he, David, had gone in to Bathsheba. So this psalm right here was written by David, the great king of Israel. And it took place, we don't know exactly when, when, it, when he actually put the pen on paper. But we do know that it occurred, this psalm was written after, number one, he had committed sin with Bathsheba. But number two, Nathan the prophet had... Basically, I'm going to tell you the story before we're done here today, had called him out about this sin and then the, the brokenness that took place in David's life through the process. So let's just go ahead and, and read and maybe where needed or the opportunities arise, we'll interject. So it says here, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. You know, in that first verse, I put—I I was looking this morning. I—I uh, I was looking that I had put some notes from way back when. Uh, this one here was from. This one that wasn't that long ago. This was from March the 8th, 2015. I put, rub it out, Lord. Exterminate. I need you to get rid of it because there is a spiritual connection between God and man. And there is a feeling in the insides of a man whose heart isn't right with God. But once the sin is forgiven and the guilt absolved, a proper relationship is restored. Mm -hmm. And the heart knows that all is well. I want you to know this morning that God wants you to know that your heart and his heart, that, that all is well. Amen? Amen. I wrote this other little note. I said, I didn't want to tell you the first picture. I said, well, you know how you see in movies sometimes that a woman has been treated improperly and she gets in the shower and she starts scrubbing herself. But I also saw a movie one time where a guy had been exposed to radioactive material and he was in the shower and they were scrubbing him, you know, and they were trying. And I get this picture whenever he says, he's saying, wash me. See, the heart that is truly repentant is like that. He becomes desperate for the Lord to wash him. He becomes desperate for the Lord to cleanse him. And I want you to know that this psalm is being written from a place of desperation. He says, wash me thoroughly, verse 2, from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. That you might be justified. When you speak and be clear when you judge, behold, I was shaken in iniquity. Many people would maybe think that this means that David saying that my mother committed adultery and that's how I was born. That's not, he's talking about the original fall of man. He's talking about the sinful nature. He understands and has a revelation that he was born in sin based upon the history of Adam. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, this is really where my, my message is coming from right here. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part. You shall make me to know wisdom. I want you to know this morning that God can flip a switch on inside of your heart and in your mind and he can make you to know wisdom. Amen. He can begin to give you the understanding of God. He can begin to give you the knowledge of God. And I can tell you something, it's a beautiful thing. It's a powerful, powerful thing for you to be able to have the mind of Christ. You will be able to see things. Listen to me, I'm not talking about Superman that sees through walls. You will be able to see things that other people Amen. cannot see. Amen. I'm telling you right now. I'm telling you right now. I was sharing, you know, I didn't plan on saying none of this, but I was sharing with Danielle this morning. Yesterday, I went to go with my with my job that I'm grateful for as times move forward for people who <laughs> okay? I drove up in this homeowner's driveway and I could see real rapidly that there a child had written in chalk real big something having to do with the spirit of the Lord. 
So I'll pull it up far enough to get out because immediately, now listen to me, I'm telling you, this is not coming from that. Oh yeah, I like to think that I'm very observant and I catch all these little details and I piece pieces of the puzzle together. No, this right here, I'm telling you, I don't talk about the gifts God has given me, but this was the gift of the Son. Immediately when I saw it, I, I, the mindset was, what is this a Christian home? But there was something in me that was telling me it wasn't. Hmm. So I pull up, and I get out, and I observe it. And at the same time, their teenage daughter's driving up. She's like, hey. So I start to look at it, and I'm walking, because it's written real big. And it had something to do with the Spirit of the Lord. And then I walked in, and when I walked in, I felt, a, and, it, and I was greeted by the man of the house. It's like immediately, I'm, I'm just telling you right now, it's the same Spirit. It's, you know what it was? It was the same Spirit that I felt when I walked into the Kingdom Hall in Homo, Louisiana. And immediately, I already knew, from the driveway into the house, it became more clear. This was not a Christian home. This was a Jehovah's Witness home. You can call it what you want. It ain't the same Jesus. Right? Right. It's a different spirit, another kind. Yeah. It's describing a whole different Jesus. And as I'm sitting there and, 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 and writing the contract and all of these things are taking place, as I'm walking out of the home, I see a notebook that says, The Holy Name. It doesn't have a name. And you wouldn't maybe know this, but I know this from all of my interactions with Jehovah's Witnesses. That's terminology that they use. What is my point? <clears throat> my point is, is that God will make you to know wisdom. God will give you an understanding and a wisdom, and he will give you knowledge that is beyond your ability that you can understand. <clears throat> The Holy Spirit will speak to you and discern things to you and help you in this thing called life. If you will believe Him and trust Him and give your life to Him. Amen? And if you will allow Him to see, to have truth on the inward parts. He goes on to say, now look at this, in verse 7. Whenever we kept singing about the Lamb and singing about the blood. Look at this word right here. I can remember the first time I studied this. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. I can remember reading that and thinking, Lord, there's something here. What is it that is here? And, and, and it, there's, there's something big with this word hyssop. And I can remember somebody saying one time, oh, well, they were making a tea and all this kind of stuff. And the Lord was like, no, no, no. And when I started to study this, some of the things that I learned from the Bible was this, is that hyssop, Solomon spoke about it, it would grow in rocky crags on walls, but it was an absorbent plant. And guess what? They used hyssop to dip into the wine and vinegar when they touched it to Jesus' mouth. But guess what? They used hyssop to dip in blood when they painted the doorpost and the side post with blood on that, egg, on that first Passover night in that exodus before the Lord released them out of Egypt. So what am I trying to tell you? That David, as a child of God, when he's crying out to the Lord in the midst of this psalm, understands the history behind him, which was the exodus of his people, and that the Lord delivered them out by striking blood upon the doorpost with this hyssop, with this absorbent plant. And essentially, poetically, as only a lyricist could do, he's saying, Lord, won't you take the hyssop, and won't you apply the blood to the doorpost right. of my heart, and won't you set me free, and deliver me from this bondage that I have found myself within. He says, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which you have broken. Listen to me, Christian. God will break your bones. He will break my bones. Why? Because he loves you. That's right. Hey, come on, amen. He loves you. And the Lord, I don't want to hear that myself, but the Lord chastens those who he loves. He is your father. Listen, you might have a bad picture of what your daddy looked like. My, my, I learned to love my daddy, but look, it, wasn't, it was perverted my understanding of God as I viewed God through the picture of my daddy. Harsh, verbally abusive. Nothing was ever good enough. And now I can, I'm, I thank God for him in some respects, but I'm here to tell you it made it difficult for me to see my God. Yeah. Yeah. But the God that you serve loves you. And he will chastise you. Yeah. And he will always do it for your better. Amen? Yeah. He will never do it for your worst. Yeah. It may seem like it sometimes. God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, no. He forsook Jesus for a moment in time. He forsook Jesus for a moment in time so that he would never have to forsake you, my friend. Amen. Jesus went through it and he endured it. You will never be alone. 
the devil might lie to you, let us say even in my message, the devil might lie to you and tell you that you're alone and that you're lonely. But listen to me, you will never have to be alone because just, oh, it's, in my, it's already in my notes, but I'm just going to, I'm getting ahead. Aloneness does not have to be loneliness. That's right. Because of what Jesus did, you can always have the presence of God with you. Whether you be in the darkest of cells, the deepest of dungeons, whether you be in the backside of the wilderness, I'm here to tell you, the presence of God will be with you. Yes. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Look at this. Created me a clean heart. I wish I could sing. Keep reading. Make oh, a yeah. song out of this. Yeah. Created me a clean heart. Oh, oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. I'm not going to keep singing, but cast me not away <laughs> from your presence. Amen. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with your free spirit. Look at this, verse 13, and I'll stop with this verse. Then will I teach transgressors your ways. Boy, I'm telling you, there's so much to preach right there. You, sometimes people are going through the valley. Here, are you in a valley this morning? Because he's the one that wrote that song, by the way. It, are you in a valley this morning? I'm here to tell you that until you've been through the valley, it's hard to teach other transgressors the ways of the Lord. God wants to produce a testimony on the inside of you. He wants to do something so great on the inside of you that he reveals his truth into your deepest, darkest places and that it emanates out of you. In yeah. other words, he's the, the excitement of God because of what he's done in your life. Fills you up so much that you just gotta share the good news. That's right. Amen. Listen to me. Amen, brother. Because look, whenever God starts to do a work on the inside of you and then you add the Holy Spirit to that, mm -hmm. how you gonna stop that? Amen? How you gonna how you gonna shut that mouth? No, you're not. You're not, sir. That, 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 you know what? I don't even know why. I just got this vision. You can cut that head off. I'm telling you right now. I believe that. You could cut that head off and that mouth would still be moving and speaking <laughs> the word of the Lord. Amen. That, wouldn't that be good? Like, I'm just saying, like, I know, <laughs> ain't none of y'all going to still be here for all that. But, but it, just imagine a Christian that's here and there's beheadings going on. Wouldn't that be something just for the, wouldn't, be, wouldn't that just be like the Holy Spirit? You chop that head off and that mouth is still moving and saying the name Jesus. Hallelujah. The love of God that was slain before the foundation of the earth. You can't shut up the witness on earth. Amen. Hallelujah. Then will I teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted unto you. Amen. Well, praise God. You know, I, uh, in these verses as the result of David's sin and his encounter with Nathan. Uh, as far as the encounter with Nathan, I just want to kind of, let's, let's just back up a little bit, because I think that if we can begin to see the things that were taking place in David's life, the things that did take place in David's life, and then we can, we might be able to better understand, we might be able to better understand what repentance looks like. It's cold up in this <laughs> And then I we'll turn the heater on and the preacher's going to fall calm. asleep. <laughs> but that's it. Right. We're not worried about it. All right. So, the first thing I want to tell you about is that Samuel, not Samuel, Nathan, the prophet. Samuel had died by this time. Nathan now was the prophet of God. David is a little bit older in his life. He's probably in his mid to late 30s. And Nathan the prophet shows up because the Lord sent him. This is after David's sin with Bathsheba. Tell you what, let's go back even a little bit further. Let's go back to the story of David's sin with Bathsheba. The Bible says that at a time when kings go out to war, David stayed back. And then he woke up one morning and he walked out on his rooftop and he saw this woman and she was very beautiful and she was taking a bath. And David, with his power as king, decides that he wants this woman for himself and he sends his servants to go over there to get her. And so they go and they get her and the Bible was explicit and said that she was clean because the days of her purification had already taken place. 
What does that mean? Well, what it means in King James language is that she had just she had already gone through her menstrual cycle for the last month, and that now she had already gone through at least seven days of purification. So, long story short, she's probably day ten to fourteen. So, what does that mean? She's ovulating. Bad timing. So he says, go and get this girl, bring her over here. And what ends up happening is, is that he lays with her, and the Bible says that she conceives. So now she's impregnated with this child. And so now that she's impregnated with this child, she goes and she tells King David, I'm with your child. Now, what a mess. I mean, here you are, big David, the king, and you know, like, yes, yeah, the boy, go get to this woman for me. But is she not Uriah the Hittite's wife? <laughs> Go get this woman for me. And then he lies with her. And I mean, listen, let's, let's, let's call it what it is. She probably wasn't that upset that she had been called for. I'm not trying, I don't know that. We don't hear a whole lot about Bathsheba. But, but, but some of the things that we learned about David was that he was a very good looking man. We'll talk about that in a second. He was a very good looking man and he was very well loved by the women of the nation. He was very well loved by the men of the nation. He was, he, David was, was the guy that all the guys wanted to be. And he was the man that most women, would, when they looked at him, they definitely saw him. All right? And so, so she's now impregnated with this child. And so David now, you know, listen, sometimes whenever things go bad, sometimes the better thing is to quit trying to fix it in your own wisdom and strength and just to go ahead and just bow your knee and give it over to the Lord. But David doesn't do that in this story. Instead, he tries to take matters into his own hand and he's going to fix it his own way. And the way that he chooses to fix this situation is... He says, hey, send Uriah, that was Bathsheba's <coughs> husband, which was a great warrior for David. He was very faithful to the, to the kingdom of God and to his king. He loved his king. Go, and, he was, and he was, again, the Bible says that he was one of David's powerful warriors. His name was well known in the circles of battle. Go get, get, fetch Uriah the Hittite and bring him here too. So David tries to get him to go and lay with his wife, and Uriah's like, mm, that ain't happening, because guess what? The ark of God and the military of God is on the battlefield, and as long as I'm breath in your lungs, king, I will not go in and lie with my wife. Boy, that, that caused some frustration for the day. Oh, Lord, what am I going to do now? So then he gets him drunk the next night. Thinking that if he's drunk, you know, his, his morality or his convictions will be loosened up a little bit. And he's been on the bed. You get the point. Nope. I'm going to sleep right here at your door. Can you sit back on the couch? So David, frantically, what does he do? He writes a letter and he gives it to his general. And in the letter, and he gives, I'm sorry, he gives it to Uriah to bring back to the general Joab. And in the letter, when Joab opens it up, it says, put Uriah on the front lines where the war, where the battle is fiercest, and then draw back from him so that he might be overtaken. That's the message. So here you have King David, the greatest king that Israel would ever have, the very man that God said he is a man after my own heart. People cannot even comprehend that. Christians that have been serving God for many, many years cannot comprehend how could David, a man that committed adultery with this, with this particular woman and impregnated her and then tried and then gets her husband killed because Uriah was killed. How could he be a man after God's own heart? But you know why? Because, see, we're all plagued with something called self-righteousness. We're all playing with something that's called salvation. And if you don't cuss and you hear another brother or sister in the Lord cuss, you're like, hmm, oh, Lord. <laughs> they still have curse words in their heart. <laughs> or, you know, if you don't smoke and they still smoke, well, one day they might be a Christian like me. <laughs> and if you've never committed adultery, and then you know that they committed adultery, right? And if you've never murdered somebody and, and they murdered somebody, that's basically what they did. He had that name murdered. I didn't mean to get into all these details, but according to the law, there was no sacrifice that you could offer up for premeditated murder. There was no sacrifice that you could offer up for adultery. No, what happened was is that you pulled the guilty parties out and you stoned them. Mm -hmm. There was no answer for that. So now all of this has happened.
and, and so what David does is, it, because there is, there is a place in David's heart, whether it doesn't look like it to you or not right now, because his heart has been hardened by sin, but he's got a soft spot in his heart, and he says, bring, bring that woman Bathsheba over here, and he marries her, and he takes care of her in the midst of all of that. But you see, God is looking for truth on the inside. Yeah. Not truth for you to go talk to another man or another woman. Listen, sometimes God will call for that. But really and truly, God's just looking for that little spot in your heart between you and him. As a matter of fact, I'm not telling you not to because you want to listen to the Holy Spirit, but you really need to be careful who you share your mess with. Because a lot of times, people that you share your mess with, they'll broadcast your mess with. Come on, somebody. Help us out. You want to make sure that you that you hear the wisdom of the Lord. But, but nevertheless, God wanted David to know that he, because he wanted David to get right with him. Because he had plans for David. And so he sends Nathan the prophet to David, and Nathan the prophet begins to tell a story. And the story that he begins to tell is, there was a rich man in the kingdom, and he had a big old flock of lambs. And then there was this one little man, and he had this one little precious lamb. And he loved that lamb. He held it and he petted it and he cared for it and he nourished it. And one day there was a stranger coming through and the rich man took, instead of taking one of his lambs, took the poor man's lamb away from the man and then he killed it and he dressed it and he used that as food for the, for the stranger that was journeying. <laughs> And so what ended up happening is, is that David immediately, with the, with the part of the Spirit of God that's still on the inside of his heart, begins to all be overwhelmed with the righteous anger of the Lord. And he says, who is this man? Because he is going to die. And then Nathan the prophet says, you are that man. So, yeah, you are that man. And through that process, it begins the, the happenings of Psalm 50. David begins a process of repentance. And at some point in time, Psalm 51 is written. So that's kind of like the background. You know, sometimes there's things that are deep within us that God wants to deal with and heal. But sin has a way of tricking our minds into saying that everything is fine. Even when the Spirit of God is saying something else. The Word and the Spirit of God are one. And in David's case, the Word was sent to him by the prophet of God. God wants to. His word to reveal his truth to our hearts. So his truth can take place instead of the hidden thing. Hebrews says that God chastens the people that he loves. Amen. It's important that we know that God's correction in our lives is merciful. It's very seldom that we like it much while it's happening. Can I get an amen? amen. Nobody likes correction. Mm -hmm. But God knows the beginning from the end, and he knows what's best for us, and he wants to get our attention so that we can let him in to deal with the deep places of our heart. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, you don't have to turn there, you know, for sake of time, but 1 Corinthians 11, 31 through 32. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. God, in the psalm, he's our Lord. The psalmist said, the bones that you have broken in the Hebrews, God chases those whom he loves. And then Paul would explain it to us. Let us learn to judge our own self. That's See, right. God, I'm telling you right now, Christian, God would much prefer that you get on your knees before the face of the Lord and you reveal your heart to him. Then you have to come talk to the pastor or you got to go talk to Somebody else. No, God would prefer that you and him do business and that you allow him to do the work on the inside of your heart so that he don't have to break your bones. That's right, man. Right. Amen. Right. God, no, he ain't in a grown breaking, breaking business. You know, like old thug in, in the streets of Philly. <laughs> Rocky Belt full of breaking bones. No, that's not the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so that's really the verse. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part. Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. And that's the title of my message, Truth on the Inside. You know, maybe understanding David and his life would be helpful to understand how God works and gets his way in our hearts. 
Because there's a lot of context and there's a lot of history in the life of David. And then I want you to know that it's a very rich history. And the thing that as we go back and we imagine the lives of the happenings in David's life, that we may be able to remember specific things that have happened along the way in our lives, right? Because God works similar to all of his children. Yes. There's all kinds of things that are happening and memories that are evoked through different situations and circumstances. And God uses all of that. So for the next little bit of time here, truth on the inside. Right? In the early years of David's life, he started his young life as a shepherd tending sheep in the employment of his father. He had several brothers. All right? He was called out of the field one day to be anointed as king. Kind of funny, but I know I'm reading it, Shane. You're here this morning. But great to have you, by the way, brother. Yes, Lord. God. We pray. I want you to know we pray for you. And, you know, along the way, I think mean, the church can attest to the fact that one, one day I said, don't, we cannot forget about Shane because I said, I don't want him to forget about me. Amen. <laughs> one time I was on a roof. In the weirdest time, I was on a roof climbing up a valley, and it was about to rain. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the Lord said, pray for Shane. So we pray for you. Thank right? you. I want you to know that. And anyway, you're here this morning. So... The reason I'm pointing that out was, is because as I was reading this, I got a picture of your son Taylor. I was, honestly, the way I personally feel like Taylor was right here. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and Taylor's got red hair. And David <laughs> had red hair. And he was better looking guy. I don't know, David might have been better looking than Taylor, but when I look at Taylor, he got that smile, and you might not even know Taylor. But if you looked at Taylor, especially when he had that long red hair, and he put that smile on his face, you, you could see where I, you could see that. But anyway, I figured that, that <laughs> Shane couldn't appreciate it. Definitely. But he was called out of the field to be anointed as king. And the way that that took place was, I don't really know how it took place, but I do know this, that Saul... The Spirit of God had been removed from Saul because Saul had been disobedient and Samuel the prophet was still alive and Samuel was mourning because Saul, the Spirit of God had left Saul and he knew that God had rejected Saul and Samuel had anointed Saul and so Saul's kind of like really sad and he broke down and he's walking around like that and all of a sudden the Lord told Samuel one day, how long will you mourn this Saul? Rise up and fill your horn with oil, and I will send you to Jesli, the Bethlehemite, and there you will anoint one of his boys to be my king. Hallelujah. And so Samuel rises up and he grabs the horn and he starts to Jesse the Bethlehemite. Start, you know that this morning it hit me. God knew Jesse the Bethlehemite by name and told Samuel, because that man was a little bit of town. In a big in a nation filled with tribes and region anyway. He goes to Jesse, and Jesse lines up his boys. And, and, and Samuel the prophet goes to the first one, the oldest Eliab, and he says, no, that's not the one. And he goes to the second, and no, 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 that's not it. And he goes through the whole process, and he gets to the last one, he's like, is there not another? Because see, the Lord had already spoken to Samuel, and he said, I'm going to reveal to you who the one is. Yeah. Well, yeah, there is one, but he's just the littlest lad, and he's in the field tending the sheep. Now, I don't know how they, they didn't have four women back then. They didn't have cell phones. So I don't know what the process would have been, but listen, he's in the wilderness with the sheep. Fetch him. Call that boy back home. I don't know if they had the chauffeur. And then another one. I don't know. But the Bible says, you know, I get this picture in my mind. Y'all probably didn't used to be all too holy to watch uh, the Seinfeld show. And how Kramer would come walking in there. Like that. That's what I get in my mind. Because it says, it says, fetch him, and then all of a sudden it says he was ruddy in appearance, and there he comes. Wow. Ruddy. His hair was red, his complexion was ruddy, and it says that he was beautiful. And he, and he shows up, and he's just like, probably, because look, this was a big deal. The problem, when the prophet Samuel showed up into Bethlehem on that day, everybody started trembling in fear. Mm. Like, are you here for a good cause? Did the city do something wrong? Did one of our leaders do something wrong? I'm here to bring sacrifice for the Lord. And they bring David in, and he just, obviously he heard the call. However they called him, he heard the call. And he comes in, he's probably sweating, his face is really red now. And he shows up, and he's like, what, what's going on? He sees the king of and he shows up. You got to think this stuff through. There's a big old crowd in there, all like, looking at him. He doesn't even know what's going on yet. And on that day, he was anointed the king of Israel. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Listen, this is another story for another time, but sometimes the anointing came long before the appointing. Yeah, See, wow. long before he ever sat on the throne, he was told by God he would sit on the throne. Man. Sometimes things God will show you in your life, and it takes a period of time before it actually comes to pass. And there's a lot of frustration. Yes, thank you, sister. Wait on the Lord. There's a lot of frustrations that can take place between point A and point B. Just keep on holding on to God, Christian. And so there he is, you know, when he gets anointed by the Lord that day. You know, there was a day whenever he, uh, you remember the story, this is the most famous story. So, I don't know how old, but I kind of tried to do some research. Numbers chapter 1 verse 3 says that in order for a man to go to war, he had to be 20 years of age or older. So, I know for a fact that when David killed Goliath, he was probably somewhere between 16 and 19 years old. Now, that's pretty, come on, man. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Not only did he have red hair and he was good looking, but this dude was not scared of battle. He was game is what they call him today. Oh, we got to fight? Okay. But the beauty of this is, is that I hadn't even talked to you about his heart before the Lord yet. We hadn't even got there. Because see, he was trained in the art of war in a whole different way. The way that typically the way that men are trained is they're trained under very harsh military. No, he was trained in the art of war as a shepherd boy. Sitting in the fields tending the sheep of God with a harp in his hand. With a harp in his hand and singing songs to the Lord. Amen. Sometimes I wonder if Psalm 23 wasn't written, at least in his heart, after this occurrence that I'm about to talk to you about regarding the giant Goliath. Because he says that the Lord is my shepherd. What a beautiful imagery. Here this shepherd, this young shepherd boy, writes these psalms or songs as he's strumming a heart. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He causes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Listen, that's a word of peace. God yes. wants to nourish you. Yes. He restores my soul. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Yeah, they're all through the valley of the shadow of death. Listen, he killed the life in the valley. Yeah. It's called the Valley of Eli. He kills Goliath in the valley. Yea, the Lord walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil for thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. He showed up on that day. His dad said, I need you to bring some cheese and some wine to your brothers. They're over there in battle. And when he shows up, the same thing that's been happening for 40 days every day keeps, takes place while David sees it. Goliath stands up and he begins to scream and he says, send me one of your warriors and he and I will fight. And everybody's cowering in the camp. Everybody's scared of the giant. And David, David says, did you just hear what, that, what he said? And he, and he says, I, I'll fight him. And everybody, and you know what happens is his brother, now I'm talking about the oldest one, Iliam, that, was, that thought he was going to be king. He was, can you imagine how pumped up he was? On that day when Samuel showed up. But then now, see, he was passed over. So I don't care who you are. I do not care who you are. I can guarantee you right now that you got some animosity in your heart now. Because somebody else got the position that you want. And he says, look at your, your insolent heart. And he says, go back and take care of them few little sheep you got. Long story short, they dress David up. But then David says, no, I got my own way to fight. See, I want you to know that the spiritual battle... That you face in life, there's only one way to really learn how to gain yeah, victory right. through the power of God, and that's sure. whenever you and the Lord get alone together, yes. and the Spirit of God begins to that's speak it. to you, Amen. That's it. Through His Word, that's it. God will speak to you through that's His Word, right. and yeah. He will reveal things about yeah. His heart to you, Amen. Amen. And what young David had learned as he strummed that harp and sang those songs unto the Lord, he had already faced some trials in that wilderness. Yeah. Any of you that have read the story know. You know, Saul said, you're just a boy. You can't go fight that giant. You know, some people would maybe even say, well, I'm not going to get into that. Oh, the jolly green giant. That's like Santa Claus and Easter Bunny. No, let me tell you, the Bible says that there were giants in the world. That's right. There was an unholy union between fallen angels Amen. and the daughters of men. And it produced Nephilim. And I'm here to tell you right now that it's real. Amen. And it was an attempt at evil to try to stop the plan of God. Yeah. And yeah. the life yeah. was one yeah. of them things. Ugly, probably. Oh, Lord, we were even after that. It was, it was not good. And Saul said, you're just a boy. You can't fight this. And he said, Master, when I was in the field tending those sheep for my father, 
a bear rose up, and a lion rose up, and the Lord gave him the power. Hallelujah. To overcome. Hallelujah. And listen, I'm just thinking about preparation in a person's life. David already knew right there. Now I understand. Now I understand why the bear showed up and the lion showed up and the Lord had been preparing me in between harp sessions and writing song sessions, learning how to sling a sling like nobody's business, learning how to wield a javelin like nobody's business, and, and, and learning how to fight for where the Lord would have me to fight. They were just preparation for this right now. That's you, right. You know it. You know, the Lord was speaking to him in the spirit. At that moment in time, we got this, son. Just trust me. And watch my spirit move through you. Yes. Yes. Now, I, 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 I read it again this morning just to make sure I wasn't crazy. But there he was. He was in the valley. It was the valley of Elah. And, and, and he said, yeah, come on and sit in the mountain. There he goes. Pop, 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 pop. Down in the valley now. I can see him walking and looking. And, and he reaches down. Boom. He grabs this one. He grabs that one. He picks up those five scoops. Oh, he sticks them in his little bag. He's still a ways off. Because the Bible says that Goliath, so I'm imagining he's hollering and it's echoing in that valley. He says, what do you want, dog? Think you're going to come out against me with your little sticks? And all of a sudden, he starts to talk about, I'm going to feed your body to the birds today. And David says, no, you come to me with spirit and sword, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. Yeah. You will fall today. Mm. And you're, you're going to die today. And all of a sudden, the Bible says he starts to run to the Lord. I can just imagine. Yeah. I don't know. I, for some reason, he's not. I know he's red-headed because the Bible says he's red-headed. But for some reason, I imagine my heart he's left-handed. I can't prove it, but I just, I just want him to be left-handed. He's left-handed. He's left-handed. And he's swinging his swing, and he's running. And he's running. And he's running straight towards the armies of the Philistines. And you can hear that there's a rumble in the crowd. There's got to be a rumble in the crowd. Like, and then all of a sudden, that rock is released, and the Bible, the Bible says it's sunk into the head of the lion. I know I'm making a movie out of it, but I just imagine in my mind that for a moment in time there was a pause. And then all of a sudden, that big old body started to fall out. <laughs> Dust. The crowd is hushed. Yep. For a moment in time. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I imagine it, it. The Bible says it. The Philistine army started to run. Wow. <laughs> and then I can imagine that even though the children of Israel were probably laughing at David one moment before that, mm -hmm. now the crowd yeah. erupts. My Lord. Yeah. Erupts. Amen. Especially whenever David goes and grabs the giant sword. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And takes that sword. I don't know big it is. I saw a painting this morning I'm telling you right now it was a whole lot bigger than that. <laughs> he grabs that sword it might have been the head from the finger but then he uses that giant sword and he cuts his head off. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible says that David took the armor of Goliath and stuck it in his tent but he brought that head back. I can't prove this but I just feel it in my heart that David picked that head up and showed it to the Israelite yeah. one. Yeah. And I can just hear him screaming even more. I can imagine him on his horse, too, because it says he brought it, he brought it to Jerusalem. I can imagine him. Can you not see him riding on his horse and holding that head up? And the people on the wall in Jerusalem cheering and, and, and just and evoking all of this celebration. Yeah. I know that I've Hollywooded it a little bit, <laughs> but nevertheless, I can see it. I know that he killed a giant that day. Victory. Amen. It was a big victory. Amen. Yes. Not just for young David, but for God. That's right. Amen. Yeah. For the Israel. kingdom of God. Because Israel. it was unlikely. Who gets the glory in that? This little boy? No, no, no. The God That's heard. right. That's right. That's why God wants to use people like you. That's right. Why he be willing to use somebody silly like me? <laughs> Amen? But because of the fact that he's going to get glory. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Not the man. He was called out of that field to be anointed as king. His brother became angry at him when he told him you need to go back and tend for those sheep. You know, but caring for sheep was a lonely job. I mean, or an alone job. Amen? Mm -hmm. You know, you're out here in the midst of the 
field, you're not with human companionship. Your brother's already a clown in you because, yeah, go take care of the little sheep that you got. And they make it, and, and, and you know, you're the youngest, and they're probably plucking you in the head and stuff like that. <laughs> but here you are, you're out there, and you're all alone. But guess what? Loneliness, aloneness doesn't have to equal out to loneliness. Yeah, because I've already told you what David was doing. He was practicing. He had time on his hands. God prepared a, a situation where he had time on his hands. Yeah. He became skillful with the heart. He became skillful with the sling. He became skillful in the art of war. He became skillful in the writing of music unto the Lord. He spent time with God. He became skillful in hearing the voice of the Lord. Yeah, that's good. Amen? He became a master musician on the harp, a master songwriter. He became skilled in fighting while protecting the sheep. But even in that story that I told you about Saul, I believe one of the big things that David learned was, see, they tried, Saul tried to put his armor yeah. on David. Yeah. And maybe this is an improper context, but I know that when the Lord started to give me an understanding of what we call the message of the cross, the sacrifice of the Lord, the message of the new covenant, I couldn't see it before. <clears throat> but then as I started to see it, I realized that what I was understanding now seems so different than what I had been taught in the church. And I'm not picking on anybody in the church. I'm just trying to tell the truth. And one of the things I'm telling you right now, there have been times in my life, even since the message of the cross and understanding it, that there have been times where there have, I haven't seen the victory like I would have expected. Yeah. But I'm here to tell you that the word of God is real and That's Jesus right. has already done it. Oh, and that doesn't take anything away from the Lord. And That's I do right. know that there is victory to be found in the finished work of the cross. Yes. Amen. But the church many times still doesn't understand. And they continue to try to fight the way that they've always fought. But I want to bring you back to that situation and that circumstance on that day whenever there's nobody really fighting. You understand? For 40 days, the same thing is happening. Goliath stands up and he, chast uh, he challenges Israel. And the Bible says that on the day David showed up, the, that the Philistines and the Israelites had gone into a ring. What does that mean? They were all dressed up and they were acting like they were going to fight. But there had not been a fight. Because the people of God had been cowering in the camp. And then whenever David says, oh, I'll fight him. Saul, the first thing Saul wants to do is put his armor on David. And you know, David was respectful as far as I can see, because that was his king. But I would imagine in his mind, he's like, you want me to try to fight in your armor? Mm -hmm. But if your armor's so good, why ain't you out there fighting at night? If your armor's so good, why ain't you give it to somebody else in the camp? He ain't saying all that. He, you know, he'd be respectful, but I mean, surely at least that's what I'm thinking. Right. His armor's right. so great. Or... Let's take it another one. I didn't plan on preaching this. Or do you want people to be confused and think that's you out there? Wow. Oh, yeah, that's a whole other one. That's just a kind of thing. Oh, that, that, see, I thought it was it is. Oh, you want the glory. No, you know what? Who's getting glory today, my friend? God is getting glory. Oh, yeah. Not King Saul, not young David. God is going to get glory today. She said, I am fighting this. This stuff isn't tried and true. I can tell you how I fight the way I learned how to fight that field. Huh? Come on. The way I learned how to fight that field when I was in aloneness with God, as I strung that harp, as I sung those songs, as God brought those things to me, and I learned the warfare of God. That's it. That's the most powerful thing that I think that David had already learned. That's it. it. To understand the power that is behind the Lord. And you understand that he's not, and yeah, listen to me, New Testament theology, if I can preach it for you this morning, I just want you to know this, God ain't asking you to do it. Yes. He's already done it. That's right. He's Amen. asking you to believe yes. that he's already done it. Yeah, and now he's saying he's going to give you the strength that you need to walk in. Yeah. Amen? Uh -huh. Praise God. Yes, thank you, Lord. You know, it's important. It's impossible again to know. But I really believe you're between 16 and 19 because he had to be 20 to be in the army. And he wasn't in the army. He brought cheese and wine to his brothers at work. So had he been 20, he'd have been in the army. So between 16 and 19 when he killed that time. What a triumph for me. Amen. You know, and then even after that, so many times of rejection. Think about this. this I mean, we're just talking about the life of David and the, and, and the history that takes place before he ever even sees that sheep. There's a history to his life. There's a history to your life. 
there's places that you were. I mean, there's people in this place that I've talked to you before about your testimony. Some people, you know, recently told me about their testimony and the things that, that they've been through in this very prominent times in their life that God has spoken to them. Whether it was in a jail cell or, or a dormitory in a jail house or whether it was in your individual life. God has brought you through things. Yes. And there's been moments in your life that all it takes is the slightest smell, the slightest little word, and the memory will be evoked and you can remember where you were and where God right. brought you out. But he was rejected so many times. You know, Saul wanted to kill him. He wanted him dead. What's interesting to me is I don't understand exactly how it happened when David was also ordered to play the harp for Saul. You know, it was either right after he killed Goliath and, and David and Saul was overwhelmed with an evil spirit and they found David to come and to play the harp for Saul and whenever he would play the harp for Saul, then that evil spirit would leave him, and from there, then David became his armor bearer. And so, by that time, he was obviously old enough to be in war. So he sat there and he fought alongside of the king until the king became really bitter and realizing that he was the one that was anointed to be king. Mm -hmm. See, because it was kind of done in secret whenever David was in war, because Samuel said that Saul would kill him, and God told Samuel, "No, you bring the sacrifice over there, and you tell him you come and sacrifice for the Lord." But surely, at some point in time, the word got back. And he started getting bitter. He didn't want to give up the throne. You know, even though that was God's will, his flag, I ain't giving up and I'm going to have to take it from me. And David finds himself on the run. There were times whenever he was, finds himself in a cave called the Cave of Adam. Where he, now he's, he's not completely alone because he's got his men with him, but listen, he's alone. Yeah. He, he's not, he's, he's running for his life. He's got controversy and stress in his life. Help me out, Chris. Because surely you've got controversy and stress in his life. Right? Controversy and stress in his life. I've been anointed, but I hadn't been appointed. Why, if God loves me so much and he called me from that field that day, why, and he gives me great victories like this, why am I going through times like this? God's still working on you, Christian. Yes. Amen. And then later, after that, his son wanted to steal the throne. Absalom. That's another story for another time. But boy, when you really think about that, that's some interesting things there. I don't think you have a son with black hair, do you, Shane? Uh, <laughs> I, for some reason, I imagine Absalom with well, black hair. Well, look, hey, you? not yet. <laughs> First Samuel 20 talks about Goliath's sword. 1 Samuel 20 talks about Goliath's sword. What is it talking about? One day David's running from Saul and he needs a weapon. And he goes to the high priest and he asks him, he says, do you have a weapon here? And the high priest says, I got Goliath's sword. The sword of the giant. That happened. Does that even happen that you accidentally show up over there? No, and you know, and that's what the sword did? I mean, I remember what I did with his armor that day. I stuck it in my tent, and I, I remember what we did with the head, but I didn't, I didn't even know you had that sword over there. Yeah, yeah give me that sword. <laughs> and I imagine, I mean, I know that I'm making Hollywood out of this, too, but it's, that was a big sword. It had to be, because yeah. his javelin and the steel yeah. and yeah. was huge. And so, I don't know how David put the sword on the horse, but in my mind, it's tied to the horse some kind of way. It's kind of slapping the horse's backside <laughs> as they're walking. Maybe it's in the front of him, I don't know. But, the, but I imagine him looking at that sword, whether it was whenever he wrapped it up, tied it up, he touched the sword. I imagine him riding where he's riding. It was about a six-mile journey. I remember doing the research on that one time. So for about six miles, you cannot tell me that memories are not being evoked in his mind. On that day when he was that little red-headed boy, and he was running towards the giant, poof, and he got that victory. And now he's running. He's running from Saul, and he's on the run, and he's, and, and, and all of a sudden, I just believe that he's reminded of the victory that the Lord has already given. Yeah. He's reminded of the fact of the times, you know, that God has been there for him. And this is why God desires truth on the emperor's parts, because that's his home. 
His spirit lives on the inside of us, and he wants to have communion with us. And when something else is on the throne of our hearts, then you know what that means? God is not there. Something right. else is there. And then Nathan comes, and he reveals what God showed him. I'm talking about when Nathan confronted David. And David's sin-hardened heart immediately melts in the presence of God. He judges himself unworthy and humbles himself to God through repentance. I would have liked to have seen that alone time with God. Yes. For that, because you know what? It went on for seven days. See, we get pictures of all these other things, or at least I'm able to kind of see something there and fill in some blanks. But can you imagine seven days of repentance? Everything David did was so extreme. Seven days of repentance and fasting as he prayed for the sick child that him and Bathsheba had given birth to, and now this child is stricken. The Bible says he wouldn't even eat. And that he was mourning this child. I'm just imagining that, you know, it's in these seven days that Psalm 51 was given birth. I'm not saying that he wrote it. Maybe he did. Maybe he wrote it in the midst of those seven days. Maybe there's times where he's standing up and he's crying before the Lord. And, and he's not eating food. And he's like, Lord, and he's repenting to God. And then he's falling on his face and he's repenting to the Lord. And he's crying out to God. And maybe he's reciting some of the Psalms, like Psalm 23, that he's already written. And then somewhere, somehow, maybe in the midst of that, he writes a verse. And he's talking about against you and you alone have I sinned. And then maybe it's another couple of days and he gets another verse, but you get the point. I don't know how it went, but I would have imagined that in these seven days, so many, I wonder if he thought in those seven days of the day that he ran in from the field and he was anointing the king. And those days when God delivered him from the bear and the lion. And that those were just preparatory victories preparing him for Goliath. I wonder if he remembered the days in the fields that he thought were bad, and then he remembered the days in the caves that were. I wonder if he remembered the crowds cheering for him. Now, you can, the musicians, y'all can come forward. I wonder, you know, I wonder what went through David's mind in those seven days when yeah. the Lord was breaking his bones. Hmm. I wonder if he again remembered that day that he came that he that the bear's lion fell and that the day that Goliath fell. I wonder if he remembered the crowds cheering for him for him. Mm. When he he came home victorious from a battle one time and the whole city yeah. cheered for him. The women sang a song for David. Saul has killed his thousands. David has Ten killed thousands. his tens of yes. thousands. Maybe that's why Saul got bitter. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I bet the word. I mean, I wonder if he remembered alone again on that horse. You know, in the midst of these seven days, and that's that horse with that sword. I don't know what that little thing is in your heart. You know, we all got one. Amen. Amen. We all got one. And what the Lord wants us to do is He wants us to give it to Him. Yeah. You know why? God wants to get back on the throne of His heart. Yeah. See, whenever I always used to read that, you desire truth on the inward parts. Yeah. That's so powerful. Yeah. We could probably preach that today. You desire truth on the inward parts. God wants his truth to reside on the inside of our heart. He wants his place back on the throne. He wants that other thing to be yes. removed so that he can sit down where he belongs. And he can feel comfortable in his place on the inside of your heart, Christian. 